Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to this Duke Business Law Society event. We are honored and very, very fortunate to have a distinguished panel of um, experts with us here today. Our speaker's exceptional work has been and still is followed closely by courts and legislators all over the world, and there are many landmark decisions <clears throat> are taught at law schools across the United States, as well as in many other countries, applied by lawyers on a daily basis, and discussed heavily by deal planners and in boardrooms. They are capitans of industry. I will introduce our distinguished panelists for today. Our moderator will be Jim Cox, who is known to so many here. He's one of the leading authorities on securities law. He's the Bernard Curry Professor at Duke, Luce, at Duke Law School, sorry, and a nationally known scholar and commenter. Sitting next to him, Stefan Lamb, a partner at Paul Weiss, Rifkin, Wharton, and Garrison. Judge Lamb served as Vice Chancellor in the Delaware Court of Chancery from 1997 to 2009. Seated next to Judge Lamb is William Chandler III. Chancellor Chandler is a partner at Wilson Sonsini, Rosetti, and Goodrich since 2011. Prior to that, Chancellor Chandler presided as Chancellor on the Delaware Court of Chancery for 14 years after serving as Vice Chancellor on the court since <coughs> 1989. Seated next to him is Myron Steele, <coughs> partner at Potter Anderson and Kuroon, and the recently retired Chief Justice of the Delaware Supreme Court. Previously, Mr. Steele served as a Vice Chancellor on the Delaware Court of Chancery. To his left is Mr. Joseph Slites. Mr. Slites is a partner at Morris James. Previously, Mr. Slites served as a judge on the Delaware Superior Court for 12 years, a position he assumed in 2000. And rounding up our panel today is Judge James Gale, a special superior court judge for complex business cases on the North Carolina Business Court. Prior to his appointment, Judge Gale practiced for 35 years at Smith, Moore, and Lifferwood. I'm turning over to Professor Cox, and thank you again for joining us today. Well, my, my role is to keep the discussion going, but uh, the most important role is to thank uh, five people who have very busy, full lives to take time out to come down to Durham and such fine weather that we've had today. Uh, uh, and swim over to the law school and, and join us and, and share their insights on an important topic. Uh, it, the topic is framed nicely in a case that was decided last June by the uh, Delaware uh, Chancery Court, which was the Boilermakers case, and very uh, briefly what it said was that a bylaw adopted by the Board of Directors that uh, provides that the exclusive form in which there can be litigation on a whole list of corporate questions, whether they be derivative or individual questions, uh, whether it be governance-based or substantive-based, uh, is in Delaware, so-called form selection clauses. Uh, uh, in the background of that is a awareness over fairly recent years that there has been not only an explosion of litigation involving deals, but that that explosion has gone national, that is, that is not just multiple filings, sometimes what we called copycat filings that were occurring uh, in the state of Delaware courts, but that it was occurring uh, outside of Delaware. And so there's a nice summary of that that's available on the web. The Cornerstone Research is one of the uh, consulting firms that provide litigation support uh, in a, a wide range of areas, has some rather staggering statistics. I'm just going to go through a couple of them here. 90% uh, of the deals over $100 million, that's not a very high threshold, by the way, uh, had uh, litigation, okay? Uh, 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 the, the Dell deal, the buyout deal involving Dell, had 26 separate suits that were filed. Uh, so that you know, gives you an idea that um, uh, litigation is an aggregate uh, event, okay? Uh, uh, what, they, what they point out is that uh, over 62% of the cases that get filed are in multiple courts, and it's staggering that something like 54% uh, uh, of the uh, things are filed in, in more than one jurisdiction, and about 8% of them are filed in three or more different states. So the litigation is exploding. 
uh, that presents, presents interesting federalism questions about uh, where, uh, uh, how one can control that, which we'll talk about in our panel. Um, and with the uh, first shoe that dropped in this process is um, uh, the form selection clauses. Um, uh, the second shoe, which is yet to be fully litigated, although there's been some skirmishes going on, is, of course, the question about if you have a form selection clause, why can't you also have a clause that provides that there shall be arbitration, not before uh, a, a judge or a chancellor, uh, but an arbitration proceeding? Uh, and then, I guess, further related to that is that you could extend it. I mean, what, what are the rights and uh, methods of those arbitrations? not to mention discovery that would precede it or not precede it, as the case may be. But just to open up, I wanted to ask our panels to weigh in on their uh, thinking about why we saw this explosion rather quickly uh, in a lot of multi-form litigation outside of, out, and particularly so much of it moving outside of Delaware. So there's two questions. Why the explosion? We notice it's going up, uh, uptick in the multiple suits are being filed, and then why is it happening um, in Delaware? Is there, is there something water wrong with the water in Delaware that we should know about here? Okay. So who wants to weigh in on that? I'll start. Oh, these are all working. I, I think the Chief Justice should start. <laughs> <laughs> Former Chief Justice. Uh, nothing wrong with litigation, the first words out of my mouth, particularly now that I'm back to private practice. I think litigation is a... <laughs> It's a wonderful phenomenon. Long may it wave. The conventional wisdom, at least in Delaware, is that if a plaintiff's counsel in a corporate-related litigable issue has a weak case, they will tend to bring it outside Delaware, even though the option to litigate in Delaware may exist. On the other hand, if the plaintiffs believe they have a strong case, they have an equal belief that that will be recognized by a Delaware court perhaps more quickly than somewhere else that's not where judges are not that familiar with uh, corporate governance or internal affairs doctrine based issues so that may be driving it and that's the conventional wisdom there isn't anything wrong with Delaware in the sense that Delaware is doing things it ought not to do that drives litigation away on the merits that's my personal view and I think that's a consensus, in, at least in Delaware, if, if nowhere else. There have been some discussion, of, and I'm sure that my colleagues here will expand upon this, been some discussion about in therapeutic settlement cases that the Delaware members of the Court of Chancery have been more reluctant recently to award fees than in the past. And it's a search for fees, I'm shocked to tell you, that often drives plaintiff's counsel to other jurisdictions where they think their opportunities to get a higher fee may be enhanced. Also, if the cornerstone statistics this year are similar to what they were last year, one of the phenomenon that I recall was while there's more multi-jurisdiction or multi-forum litigation, there's still substantial litigation in Delaware. It's just in Delaware and in other states, rather than exclusively in Delaware or between the Delaware Court of Chancery, our state court, and the Delaware district court. So th those are my opening comments and observations. <laughs> Chancellor? <laughs> Chancellor? Former, former, former Chancellor. We should go in order of salary, not in order of former office, and I'd, I'd be talking last, I think. <laughs> well, I, I agree with uh, everything that, that uh, I agree with everything that uh, the former Chief Justice uh, said. My, my own observation is, and I was involved in the Chevron litigation, uh, is that over the past 15 or 20 years, there's been a balkanization of the plaintiff's bar. Uh, that is, there's been, uh, formerly there were a few large plaintiff's firms. Now I think there are uh, a lot more, and they are very competitive. Uh, and so the, for me, looking at this phenomenon of multi-form litigation, the only constituency that systematically benefits from the complexity and expense of intracorporate litigation in multiple jurisdictions is the plaintiff's bar. And I think that phenomenon has been pretty much studied and analyzed, and the cornerstone research and others, I think, other academic studies sort of demonstrate that. But I, I agree that I don't think it's something about the way the Delaware courts are deciding cases that has caused this phenomenon. Um, although there might be plaintiff's lawyers who would say that they do think there is some additional leverage to be gained uh, by being in other jurisdictions when they have particularly weak claims or cases. 
but, but that's my own observation. Well, I would join all of those comments. Um, and, and in particular, I, would, uh, I suppose I would only add that um, I think there are many more of plaintiffs engaging in this activity than there used to be. And there are firms, not just, it used to mean principally firms in New York and Delaware, and there might have been a few other national players from other places, but much less, much less likely. Now there's a lot of uh, firms from California who are very much involved in this part of the world, and um, they, they uh, often come and litigate in Delaware, but they often decide to go elsewhere. And it's when, I think just when, if you think about plaintiffs trying to organize themselves once they file lawsuits, uh, when you're, you're a plaintiff's lawyer and you're trying to you know, get yourself positioned so that you have the most charge of the case and the biggest piece of the fee, uh, you, you may often, you may well find that having a case in another jurisdiction is a very useful device for you in negotiating with the plaintiffs in the other jurisdiction. So I think there's a lot of that going on. Uh, there are firms, I mean, I think some of it has to do with the PSLRA and with SUSLA, and I assume you know what those are. And so plaintiff's firms that used to make a living doing other things, you know, didn't get those clients. And so uh, there, there is no sort of, in Delaware, there's no gate about, no, no express gate about whoever has the most shares wins. So uh, a lot of those, those plaintiffs, I think, look to Delaware or state law corporate litigation, which isn't covered by SUSLA as a way to make a living. And they're just, they're somewhat really pr premier plaintiff's firms who never used to do this work at all and who are now doing it. And at least one of them is one of my former law clerks <laughs> who is at the Berger firm and he talked them into starting this business and he's quite successful at it. So there's more people doing it. I think in some ways there more, there's more talent on that side of the, of the V than there used to be. And that ex to me that explains both why there's so much more litigation and why people, at least in part, go and file in, diff in various jurisdictions. It's a very fascinating dynamic, too, because if you think about it, in most instances where a plaintiff's lawyer is trying to decide where to sue a company, the last place they'd want to do that is in the company's backyard. You're looking for a, a jurisdiction where maybe you're not going to get hometowned. But in these competing um, deal litigation cases, it's usually Delaware and the company's principal place of business that's that's at issue. And so, uh, certainly, commentators have have wondered how bad is the corporate conduct at issue when a plaintiff's attorney is willing to sue the company in its backyard. Uh, but it, it is a, a, a fascinating dynamic. I think the federal legislation that uh, Vice Chancellor Lamb just mentioned, the timing seems to fit. It can't just be coincidental that the uptick has, has occurred since uh, that legislation was enacted. So I think that's a big part of it. In those cases where it has been an action brought in North Carolina and in Delaware, in the instance that I've had there, it, it seemed to me um, a, a pretty obvious effort uh, by one of the law firms who felt as if they did better outside of North Carolina and had a strategic uh, business plan. At least the defense were arguing the strategic business plan was to be outside of Delaware uh, because of either the, and they had had successes in Delaware, so they just chose for whatever business reason to do it. Uh, in those cases where there are mergers that are governed uh, by North Carolina law instead of Delaware, we also see uh, you're not going to find one large deal that has one class action. It, 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 it's a multiplicity of class actions in both state and federal court. Part of it appears to be a pretty open jockeying for position of who's going to get to be the, the lead of the lead counsel committee uh, and, and settling on that out. There's been an argument that, that if you are appointed as lead counsel in an out-of-Delaware action, it may give you leverage to get on the committee of counsel in Delaware. I don't know whether that, that I'd have to defer to the Delaware judges on that. Um, 
there's a in addition to the to the perception that Delaware is becoming increasingly um, heightened scrutiny in approving the fees, that Delaware is a um, much tougher place uh, on a weak case to get expedited discovery and a preliminary injunction hearing. Uh, and that in, whereas in state court you can convince a, a, a relatively uninitiated state court judge that this is really, really important and tie up uh, expedited discovery and injunction. And I wonder sometimes whether you use an out-of-state, out-of-Delaware action in order to try to get discovery for a case that ultimately is going to be in Delaware. But, but those, those are as much suspicions as they are experiences. I wonder if some members of the panel or all the panel would want to address the question about just the substantive and procedural problems you have if you have litigation going on in five or six different uh, uh, jurisdictions, federal courts, states. Uh, 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 the Delaware court, for example, being able to stay and join or otherwise in, impair the ongoing, the suit going elsewhere, okay? Can somebody pick that up just by way of background about why, why, why does this arise through, quote, contracting through the bylaws? Why doesn't it arise uh, dealing with the question of multi-form litigation occur through exercising a power of a court? Well, well, I'll I'll take a stab at that. I mean, I, I think, uh, Jim, that used to work uh, long ago. I, I don't think it works as well now. Duke used to make the Final Four, too, by the way. That's right. <laughs> Something tells me they will. They used to make the Sweet 16. <laughs> um. <laughs> oh. Final Four? We'll get past the first round. <laughs> wow. <laughs> they have food. Remember, they have food that could be watching this way. <laughs> Um, but historically, this was not a, a problem, and it used to be courts in other states would either abstain or they would defer or stay the litigation. Um, and I was a proponent while I was on the bench of trying to reach out when once this phenomenon began to take hold of multi-jurisdictional litigation, of reaching out to my colleague in the other courts. And I would if the lawyers would agree to that, and frequently they would ask me to do that, to, to try to coordinate the litigation, I would pick up the phone and I would call the judge in the other jurisdiction. And I, I did it several times with judges in New York, with judges in Ohio and Texas and Maryland and North Carolina, with Judge Tennille when he was on the bench. And in every instance, we were able to work out where one court or another would go first and the other one would sort of defer or stay until that court had decided the case. And it seemed to work. For whatever reason, it doesn't work as well today. Now, I don't know what the explanation is for that exactly, but one explanation I've heard, and it seems plausible to me, is that a lot of states are in the business of creating specialized courts, specialized business courts, to handle uh, commercial and contract and corporate litigation. And the judges on those courts, quite naturally and understandably, feel like that's what they're here for. That's their purpose. That's what they were installed in office for or appointed to this specialized court to do. And, and it makes less sense to them, frankly, to say, well, why should I defer to the, the Delaware chancellors when I'm here for a reason, too? So that may be a partial or maybe all of the explanation. I don't know. But it happens a lot less today than it used to. One, one of the ironies, to, to my mind, that's been continuing is we promote in Delaware the fact that our general corporation law and the hundred years of written opinions that have developed a substantial common law interpretation of that code is predictable law, it's consistently applied, and it's clear. That makes it very difficult to argue to another state court judge on a business court, you should yield in favor of us because we know Delaware law. You can't have both sides of the argument. You can't say your law is so easily understood that it can be applied routinely around the country and at the same time say, wait a minute, you, you should yield in favor of Delaware because after all, the company chose to charter here, the stockholder chose to buy stock in a company chartered here. It's logical to believe that the, those who invest and those who create corporations choose a place to charter based on the law and the court system in that state. Fifty-one percent of the publicly traded companies in this country are chartered in Delaware. That's no small matter. We have a million business entities, more than we have people chartered in Delaware. Not that people are chartered in Delaware. More companies <laughs> chartered in Delaware than people living in Delaware's 
what I, what I meant to say. God, it's hard to go back to private practice and try to be articulate. <laughs> So, so that's been, a, that's been a, a real dilemma for us. But what I think the Delaware judges have tried to do, certainly under the period of time that both Vice Chancellor Lamb and Chancellor Chandler, in particular when he was leading the court, try to distinguish is there are circumstances under which there are issues of first impression. There are substantial issues affecting the application of Delaware law. And the argument would be made to those other jurisdictions, despite how easy it is to understand our law, we should be given first crack at it. And that has been, was my experience the six years I was on Chancery, and I, I, I hope that's the experience that, that Chancellor Chandler and Vice Chancellor Lamb have had. I think regardless of what area of litigation those of you who might choose to litigate uh, decide to enter into, you're going to find that this phenomenon of multi-jurisdiction litigation is an issue. Judges are aware of that. I think there are concentrated efforts now to try to figure out ways to cooperate along the lines of what Ch Chancellor Chandler just mentioned uh, to determine how best to use judicial resources to uh, handle litigation in multiple fora. Uh, it, becomes especially difficult, however, in deal litigation because, uh, especially on, on the company side, the um, concern is that these are sophisticated issues involving often nuanced questions of corporate law, and there's just not a great deal of confidence that judges in other jurisdictions, not because they're not intelligent people, but just because they don't deal with these issues regularly, that they're going to be able to work their way through those issues. Um, I had a corporate client recently who told me it's kind of the Forrest Gump factor. You know, judges are like boxes of chocolate. You just never know what you're going to get when you go outside of Delaware. And, and so the, the suggestion is you've got a couple options. You can go to that foreign court. And you can ask that court through a motion to stand down, to stay their hand in favor of Delaware. Uh, you can go to the two judges simultaneously along the lines of what Chancellor Chandler just said and ask them through a formal application to coordinate with each other to see who goes first or how to best use resources. Or you could go to the Delaware court and ask that court to enjoin the lawyers and the parties in the other jurisdiction from prosecuting that case. Uh, that really is only going to happen if you have a forum selection clause. And even then, the Delaware courts thus far have been reluctant to do that. And so uh, even if you have one of these forum selection clauses, the real question becomes, what do you do with it when somebody decides that they're going to ignore it? What, what rights do you have really to enforce them, to make them meaningful? And that question, frankly, is still um, unanswered. How best and most efficiently do you enforce these things? Well, Bill, I think um, uh, there is a tremendous <coughs> increased uh, attention to business courts around the country. Uh, some of them uh, call it business courts by name, and some of them really roll up their sleeves and get to do it. Uh, I think there are a couple of points to be put in perspective is Delaware uh, also recognizes the internal affairs doctrine. So I think uh, Vice Chancellor Parsons just very recently stayed the Delaware court proceeding in favor of a foreign jurisdiction. So it, it works both ways in terms of the internal affairs doctrine. Uh, and, and I think um, uh, from a judicial perspective, um, I've got a perspective of how hard it is to stay in, turn, in, in touch with the trends on the things that are on the cutting edge because these deals push the new issues, that's the, the way they structure them. So because uh, under the LLC Act and otherwise, I have to apply Delaware law pretty frequently, and so I try to follow the blogs and follow the courts, et cetera, but it is, it is, it is, it is, it's an intensive exercise to try to stay anywhere close to being current uh, and so a judge who's going to expose to some of these issues on the, on the very first time, so like next week I've got to do a don't ask, don't wave provision on an auction. That, that's, that, you know, that's, there's a couple of Delaware cases, that's it. Um, but I, I think a business court that's got enough other things to do 
we don't lose our dignity by letting the Delaware case have those issues that are on the cutting edge. Uh, but there are a lot of judges who are politically appointed with the objective of you're on the business of court because that's the way to de develop business for our state, and they're under political pressure, I believe. Can I just ask you, Judge Gill, so if you, if you had a, a phone call that came in from Delaware or another state that asked you to stand down, <laughs> uh, so to speak, about on a case that was in multi-jurisdictions, do you, do you, have you thought about what kind of the heuristics or framework for how you think about that in terms of? First of all, I, don't, I think a call that would come in from Bill would not be to stand down. We have two cases pending. What do you think we want to do? And he would encourage the reason analysis to be, yeah. uh, frankly, he would like for me to be the first one to raise the idea of perhaps I should defer to you. But, there, but, but and, and it might, uh, under the right case. But there are other cases I know where I think, uh, I think, I don't know which of you it was that's worked with Ben Tenniel on that one. But rather than just saying it's one or the other, they actually held some joint hearings, and there are things and aspects of the business transaction going that are local, that are other things that are a matter of internal governance. Um, and so they actually coordinated simultaneously, not just standing down. Uh, and then the, the, the vice chancellors and chancellors of the, of the Delaware Chancery Court have been wonderful when the business court calls, we've got this issue, can you tell us which way we're looking at it as a matter of North Carolina law that looks to Delaware law, and, and they're, they're available as a resource. So ultimately, uh, I think the call should be a welcome. We know each other through American College Business Court judges. So it, 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 but if you get somebody who's never seen them and you call them up and says, oh, by the way, I'm calling to tell you you can't handle this lawsuit, it would not be well received. <laughs> and, and, and I will say, I won't say this is a trend because I doubt that it is, but there have been instances where the Court of Chancery has, has taken the step of standing down because another case has advanced far enough along. The issues are not that complex that you're going to be blazing new trails. And the court has said, this is the most efficient use of resources. Discoveries occurred. You've got hearings scheduled. We're new in the case. And the court has. I, I think you really have to distinguish between cases that concern what we call the internal affairs doctrine. And we've been using that in this discussion. Every, I want to be clear, everybody here knows what we're talking about, and which would be relationships inside the corporation. So a suit by a shareholder against the board of directors or against the corporation if it's a class action in some cases, versus other claims that, you know, just two parties to contracts who uh, agreed in their contract to a particular venue and then brought, brought suits and venues outside of that area. Or in another case, another situation, just two parties to a contract where one person brought the enforcement action in Texas and the other one brought the declaratory judgment action in Delaware. I mean, there's a whole mix of these circumstances where two courts have to try to figure out uh, or could actually take the opportunity to coordinate with each other. But we're really talking about the, the first one where it, it involves internal affairs issues. And I mean, to me, one of the one reason to always think that it, it should be deferred to the state of incorporation is just, you know, people agree to serve as directors of corporations and they do so with the understanding, uh, if it's a Delaware corporation, that you know, when there is a, a, an internal affairs dispute, that it will be resolved in accordance with Delaware law. And I think they like to believe that the case is going to be in the Court of Chancery. You know, not in, in, in understanding it might be in the district court in Delaware, but you know, not, not really thinking it's going to be in California or New York or Michigan. Uh, it's a very confusing area because, of course, the same, if it, some of the same claims that are presented as internal affairs disputes under Delaware law could be, for example, framed as a 14A case uh, and brought in federal court. So, so there's, um, it, it's, it's my understanding there are multiple templates out there that law firms are using to draft the form selection clauses. Um, do you envision that we're going to find some challenges to those, that some of those clauses are going to be more vulnerable than other clauses? And if so, what would be some of the hot spots you'd be looking at to think about the problems that were going to come up with these? So it's one thing to have the clause recognized by the Delaware Chancery Court as, you know, as, 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 a, as a concept basis of being valid. Another thing, how it applies or has been drafted or like that, that could be another situation. That's what I'm asking. I'm just 
it, I think it's an evolutionary process, and I think some of the first ones, for example, that were used uh, didn't even recognize that the case, any case covered by it might be brought outside of the Court of Chancery. Might, might be able to, might be brought in the district court, or even depending on the nature of the case, might have to be brought in the superior court. So if, if, you're, if you're, you're trying to reach a very broad general, you know, a very broad category, or some of them, I think, you know, tried to, purported to apply themselves to federal securities law cases, uh, which probably likely isn't, isn't uh, yep. going to work. So. Analogies to sports don't always work, but the recommendation I would make to somebody drafting a forum selection bylaw or a, an amendment to a charter that purports to have an exclusive forum, play small ball, don't swing for the fences. Be very careful in the way in which you draft it and focus it like most people are doing, particularly with IPOs and those who are passing bylaws, even those who are submitting them to shareholders for approval of the bylaw, which is a very wise move when you think you can make it happen. Clearly define the scope and breadth of the application that restricts it to Delaware. By way of example, issues involving the internal affairs doctrine, issues arising out of claims of breach of fiduciary duty by directors or, or officers, interpretation of statute within the Delaware General Corporation law, interpretation of the corporate papers, the charter and bylaws. Start small, and if the cases develop in an area where it seems in, internally consistent and logical to have those issues in the state and the state court system where your corporation chose to charter, I think you'll have a better likelihood of success. I think you, your cost-benefit analysis and the scope of your risk increases when you try to include anything beyond the class actions and the derivative suits that will arise out of that subject matter. One area that I think uh, will be interesting to watch develop and likely will be the subject of challenge. I mentioned before that it's difficult to figure out how to enforce these provisions. So if you have an instance where a stockholder has brought suit in a jurisdiction other than Delaware in a corporation wishes to try to enjoin that from occurring, one of the problems you're going to have if you go to Delaware is how do you get jurisdiction over that stockholder? Uh, a stockholder doesn't consent to jurisdiction necessarily simply by buying stock in a Delaware corporation. So uh, the question is, can you include a consent to jurisdiction provision within the choice of forum provision in either a bylaw or or charter, and if so, would the court of chancery enforce that provision? And I see that as an issue that may come up because in the one case I was involved in where we did try to enjoin an action outside of Delaware, we did confront a, a serious challenge to personal jurisdiction mounted by the stockholder who happened to live in Canada. Well, and I defer to Bill because Bill's on the on the forefront of, of litigating the issue in the Chevron case that, um, that came up in the Bulls Makers, um, and there's been a lot of iteration. But um, some of your early clauses uh, were not only all inclusive but non discretionary, so that, so that you've begun to add fiduciary out point, uh, provisions right. mm -hmm. uh, because there's some instances of where the corporation can't get jurisdiction either, um, uh, and so. Uh, and ultimately, a, 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 an out-of-state judge looking at it is going to say, was there a standard to hold them to a good faith, and what was the good faith exercise? And if, if, if it's non-discretionary, it may not be. The, these things do come in, in different flavors. There's permissive and mandatory uh, form selection bylaws. There are bylaws. The Chevron bylaw, for example, was amended during the course of the litigation uh, to make it clear that it wasn't just the Court of Chancery that had jurisdiction. The FedEx bylaw, which was the companion case to the Chevron, had just the Court of Chancery, um, even though there might be claims that don't implicate equity, that claims that are in federal court or should be. So Chevron amended the bylaw to try to take that argument away from the plaintiffs. The chancellor's decision ultimately didn't draw a distinction between it at all. So it sort of leaves it uh, an open question. But the other iterations of these bylaws are being drafted as we speak. Ones that would include, for example, that stockholders, by the adoption as bylaw, stockholders consent to injunctive relief, equitable relief, in order to enforce the, the uh, bylaw itself. The very issue that 
uh, that Judge Slights faced in, in the case with Edgen. Uh, others are inc including uh, fee shifting provisions, where if the plaintiff files in a foreign jurisdiction, not a designated jurisdiction, and loses the motion to go forward there, they have to pay the company's fees and expenses for litigating that question. And iterations like this, I, I, I would agree with Ch former Chief Justice Steele about this, probably better to play the safe game. But if you don't, and there are some who don't want to, there are, there are clients and there are some academics who say it's like chicken soup, it can't hurt you, draft it as broadly as you want, and put a severance clause at the end of the bylaw provision so that the court can blue pencil some part of it that if it wants to. So some take that view, but that, there are different iterations of this. And of course, the big one that's coming is going to be the one Professor Cox mentioned, the arbitration clause provision. Well, it, it, give you a practical example of how it come up is, is, let's say you have a, uh, an acquisition of a Delaware chartered corporation with principal price of business in North Carolina. Uh, and not only are there lawsuits that challenge the validity of the merger, but there are lawsuits that challenge uh, the validity of the severance packages that are being forfeited by, you know, just traditional straight employment claims, et cetera. And, and, and the forum selection clause reaches everything. And so they bring the first lawsuit, the challenge to forum selection clause is not the mergers and acquisition case, it's, it's the state law, law question. And, and the bylaw fails, what happens then? Uh, now, again, that's where you depend on where the state. I still would say on internal affairs, I might, on my own discretion, defer to Delaware on that issue. It would work hand in hand. But, you know, at some point in time, the plaintiff's bar is going to be pretty creative when they find something that to invalidate one of these, and breadth is going to be their ally, I think. Another issue is timing. I mean, when, when are these things adopted? If, if they're adopted on a clear day when the board is, you know, going along doing its day-to-day, work-a-day business, that's one thing. If they're adopted immediately after uh, approving a transaction or a feature of a transaction that could be questioned, then that is another thing altogether. And may, may so now it's actually become quite common in the last couple of months in connection with um, announced public company M&A transactions that people are adopting these as, may even be required to adopt it by the acquiring party who says, I want one of these provisions uh, and you, you know, to make sure that this litigation is all brought in your state of incorporation. Well, the, the class should be extremely excited because we've just pointed out to you multiple issues still to be resolved <laughs> through litigation. That's a very good thing, ladies and gentlemen. And, and the bigger, the bigger big question a little bit, Jim, is what does the institutional market think of these things? Chevron had a shareholder proposal to rescind the bylaw, which Chevron beat back in a 60-40 vote. But there were different views held by the institutional market. I mean, T. Rowe Price doesn't like it. Uh, Vanguard and Fidelity were okay with it. Uh, the, the proxy advisors, ISS and Glass-Lewis, don't, don't like, like them it. at all. Um, and so That's you have to deal have with that. That's because they don't understand the real world. Why in the world, if you're representing an investor's interest, would you not believe that that investor would be protected by having access to the courts of the state in which the corporation which they just invested is chartered? I don't understand where they're coming from. Well, here's their argument, with all due respect, Chief Justice. Well, they can have an argument. That didn't make it a good one. Their argument is that if the company has a demonstrated showing of having expended lots of company money over a period of time withstanding multi-jurisdictional litigation, then you have a justification for these kinds of bylaws. If you don't have that, then you don't have a justification for it. So you can't look to the guy next door and see that the person next door has just had the fire? No, you, you, have you to can't get sick buy the. Yourself. You, you have, have to, to actually have the fire yourself before you can buy the insurance. That's policy. right. <laughs> That's well, very theory. sensible. My guess is they don't get flu shots either. Then. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, how about how about the uh, you know the the elephant in the room? Let's let's shift over. Is it uh, just a general question? Do you see cause to change some of your emphasis on about? Uh, form selection clauses, if we were talking about, it's not only a selection about where it's going to happen, it's going to be the means and manner, namely arbitration. Does that, does that change the equation at all for you to think about these issues, or is it, is it it's still the same? A contract is a contract is a contract. I think it, it, from the point of view of Delaware 
judges and practitioners, uh, public, there, there is something very close to a public policy objection to permitting entities to, by 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 bylaw or by you know, bylaw or charter, or whatever, to uh, basically opt out of the judicial system. Now, it's going to be very hard to draw the distinction. It's going to be very hard to enforce because of the federal law. But. It's, and it's hard to articulate that in a way. I mean, I can't imagine what that brief looks like. I tried to, except for saying, you know, we're going to put you out of business, Judge, if you approve these arbitration provisions, so you ought to think about that. <laughs> dot, dot, dot. <laughs> well. Um, <laughs> but, but, but I agree. I think the public policy argument is probably the strongest one because otherwise, as you know, there's a presumption favoring arbitration in most jurisdictions. There's a federal <laughs> act that you've got to contend with. Uh, it's, I mean, I think it's a hard sell to, to get around those. And the courts that have addressed the issue thus far have had a hard time really distinguishing form selection from mandatory arbitration. I mean, the, the effect ultimately would be that the state would lose control over the implementation, interpretation and implementation of its own laws. Right. In an area that is of vital, vital importance to Delaware. So. But the, 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 on the Forrest Gump, when you pull out the piece of chocolate uh, that, that wants to come up with a different result, I think arbitration gives you a vehicle to closed in public policy to, to, to get from the end and working backwards. Um, I do think, you, as, as, as uh, uh, pointed out, you bump into federal law because of the Federal Arbitration Act, but a, a state court could challenge the validity of the agreement to arbitrate on the basis of the fact that the bylaw went beyond and you shouldn't have implied consent to an arbitration clause that takes you out of a constitutionally guaranteed forum access to the courts. That would be the argument. I, I, I think it would be a difficult brief to write. And if you think ISS and, and the other investors don't like forum selection clauses, yep. they are going to hate arbitration clauses. And Which I, have been I, upheld, by the way, in Maryland. There have been. Yes, absolutely. There yeah. was a case in Maryland with oh, Bill. Man. Bill would serve as the arbitrator, so he knows all about it. <laughs> where two, where a, a couple of people who were had control of a company and been running it for years, in the face of you know, seventy percent of their shareholders wanting them out, managed to drag the thing out for a year. And in the end, they, they, they got 82% of the stockholders to actually vote in favor of removing these people. But they stayed in power for a year. And they, should have been, they could have been gone in a couple of weeks or a month. So, uh, but I, I really, as a widespread matter, the investors simply are going to hate it. And they, they, they won't tolerate a board of directors. I think the SEC has things. spoken out, too. I mean, the I exchanges will do something. Everything's going to go nuts if anyone really tries to do this. <laughs> So, so do I. What do you think? I do. I do. I agree. <laughs> so, so do we. We do. We do. We think that that um, opposition from the investment advisory group, the investment community itself, uh, the representatives, the Council of Institutional Investors, and the SEC, that that's going to have some s slowing, retarding effect on the adoption of arbitration clauses. Or well, it had, there is no. There is no rush to do this. I mean, okay. there's one. I'm aware of the. I'm probably there's more than one, but there was one Maryland. Reed that did yep. it. Yep. The, right, right. But I think it was just recently um, approved again in a federal case. So, uh, well, it's the same case. Same case, but the judge said, "What's new?" Clause. Right. <laughs> it was the same matter. Judge, though. I mean, different judge, but the judge said, "Well, what are you?" It might have been the same judge. I don't remember. I think it was the same judge. Same judge. Was it? Same yeah, judge. it was just a different case, and they just said, "Well, what are you going to tell me that they didn't tell me last time?" Right. From, from a pragmatic point of view, you would think that the people who are directing the affairs of entities would focus on how the forum selection bylaw or charter amendment will fare before they rush into an arbitration bylaw. It just the effect on the investor community, the distaste that people will have generally for it, just doesn't make good business sense to me from a small P or a capital P in anything. Anything that invites federal intervention by statute is anathema to some of us. And this certainly does that. I th let's hope that you can just count on the, invest the investor community to keep this from happening. So is, is there any room for viewing, whether it be form selection clauses or arbitration clauses, 
differently if they arose in the context of an LLC than if it arose in a standard general corporation? Is, there, is, that, is that a litmus that ought to persuade a court and how the heuristics are going to apply, how closely they're going to scrutinize one versus the other, or are they going to be lumped together and in, indistinguishable? Well, I'll just start with one comment. It, it, in the minds of many people, it depends upon whether the LLC is a close or an open publicly traded MLP or LLC. Because we're, we're talking with alternative business organizations, hopefully, like LLCs, particularly LLCs that don't have a common law history, we're talking about contractual relationships. And if as that LLC is formed, the investors and the managers selected by the investors agree to a, a forum selection clause of some kind or another by contract, then any court worth the salary of the judge should follow the contract in the absence of fraud. I, th I think that's right. And it, it, on the one hand, you're very, it's, it's very unusual these, even, I mean, so far to have publicly traded entities like that other than in certain areas like oil and gas and that sort of thing. They, they, generally, they're not. But it, it, you would look at the, at the operating agreement, which might, might have limited fiduciary duties. It might not. I mean, maybe it hasn't changed the, the application of fiduciary duties at all. So I think it, you would look at the contract and make your decision based on that, I would assume, not based on sort of assuming that fiduciary duties have been eliminated then you don't. Jim, before we run away with this too far, I think it helps to remind everyone that when now Chief Justice Strine decided the Chevron case, some people don't like to call it Boilermakers because it gives you the image of standing in a tavern taking a shot followed by a beer, but <laughs> in, in Chevron, his... What's wrong with that? <laughs> well... It's a good image. <laughs> well... His point was that the forum selection bylaws are legal under Delaware law. The board can adopt a bylaw. He made it very clear that we'll have to see how they're implemented in real world contextual scenarios before we know whether or not in equity they can be enforced. And we're a long way from factual scenario after factual scenario that gives us an idea of how far we can go. And that's, that's true in the LLC arena or ABO arena as well as in the corporate arena, I think, anyway. I hope. I, I think, Jim, as a matter of statutory construction, legislatures generally are deemed to be more protective of shareholder rights than they are of LLC rights. And so you, you start from that perspective. Interesting. So as a way of transitioning, I want to have some questions from the audience, but a way of transitioning to that uh, is... is Going back to the original problem, which is multi-form, multi-litigation, is is there a better solution than the one we've been talking about? Is there a better solution than form selection clauses? Or can you can you think of a, an answer that would be handling it, or is this the is this the nice, clean solution? Then uh, we ought to run with it for a while and see how it works. Well, I think we're in a position where we're going to run with it for a little while and see how it works. I don't think anyone has come up with a better solution other than the Federal Judicial Conference and the Conference of Chief Justices have tried to work together on a methodology, a protocol, a template, however you want to characterize it, for judges that are facing multi-forum litigation to work together to resolve it. That's difficult to achieve and difficult to convince everyone to be on board, but both those organizations have been pressing for a solution short of legislation. But we'll have to see how it plays out. I don't know of a better solution. I mean, there, there are certainly those that now um, are advocating an expansion of the internal affairs doctrine so that it's no longer just a choice of law doctrine, but it becomes kind of morphs into a choice of forum doctrine also so that you would have a state of incorporation default rule. But the problem, again, with that is it's a great idea. It allows some predictability and certainty. But everybody's, I mean, if somebody isn't signing on the bottom line to that compact that says this is the rule we're all going to follow, then you're still going to have multi-jurisdiction litigation. There's going to be a state that decides we don't follow that rule. The plaintiffs will find that in the right case if they can. And so, so what this does potentially is at least make it a, a decision 
between the company and its stockholders, uh, contractual understanding, whether it's actual or implied, that at least gives judges some basis to understand that it's a right outcome, that it's not something that's being imposed on the stockholders, that this is something that they have consented to or assented to. Uh, and, and that then becomes a basis to enforce it. But until all states are on the same page, and that will never happen, I doubt. Um, or, you know, God forbid the feds jump in, which hopefully they won't. Uh, I, don't, I, don't know, I don't know how else to deal with it. It's the best solution that people have been able to come up with, and people have thought a lot about it because it is a big problem. Yeah, I, I don't think anybody's come up with a better solution, would, uh, and I hope we don't look at it, frankly, but, but if the right case for the plaintiff's bar that wants to challenge them comes up, and all of a sudden there's case laws that invalidates these, I'll be interested to see what the exercise has, has, has brought forward after that. Uh, uh, if, you try, if you try to enforce them and are unable to, I don't know what we've unleashed. But we'll see. We have some time for some questions from the audience here. Uh, Deborah? Yeah, just very illuminating, quite wonderful. Uh, so one possibility that hasn't been mentioned by any of you that I would like to then ask about would be state legislation specifically in Delaware. Uh, my analogies here in mind are roughly as follows. I mean, my own understanding of boilermakers <laughs> is that the kind of consent on which the contractual argument turns is not that robust. It's, it's implied. It's sort of consent to something that theoretically you know could happen, but you don't know exactly what it might be. As consent goes, I think, within the law, that's, that is pretty attenuated. It's just a, it's a, just a comment on the intellect and the theoretical linchpin in the argument. Um, you know, several of you emphasized, and, and I agree, that Boilermaker is very much an opinion written in the grand tradition of the Court of Chancery as Court of Equity. I mean, it's very nuanced. It's very, you know, we're kind of waiting to kind of see how these play out, and then we need additional specifics in which to react. And I think, it, you know, a concern that, that from the somewhat have is that opinions like that that are so nuanced don't translate into a bottom line, you know, to be understood by some council and some courts elsewhere, you know, as well as, say, a statutory provision. So I, wonder, I was thinking when, when uh, Vice Chancellor uh, Lamb was talking uh, about Section 3114 in the Delaware Code, which is the section that addresses the here implied consent right, to personal jurisdiction in Delaware by directors and officers when they undertake this particular office. It's right there in the statute. It's very explicit. Uh, any lawyer should know in advising a client who's about to become a director or officer of a Delaware corporation of 3114 and its implications. Uh, that, too, is a form of implied consent, but it's very specific and it's very explicit. So I was wondering whether, uh, not that this resolves the multi-jurisdiction question, okay, uh, whether just from the standpoint of Delaware itself, whether further definition of, in the statute, of the powers of directors to adopt such provisions uh, might help clarify this. Now, this is, of course, not <coughs> dreaded federal statutory intervention. Right, into corporate law, but a further uh, iteration as has happened over time. Okay? You, you could. I mean, in the Delaware statute. Yes, 3114, I think, is, <coughs> to me, it's covering a different issue because personal consent, to, or assertion of personal jurisdiction over a non resident is a matter of federal constitutional law. And we had the Schaffner versus Heitner case that said we couldn't use some other means to do it. So that was crucial to us to, or to the state to, to, to pass that law. Um, this is much less of a constitutionally based problem, I think. Uh, and 
as you know. I mean, the, the theory is just the board of directors has the power to amend the bylaws, and if this is if this is a bylaw that is valid under state law, then anyone who owns the shares was aware that the board might adopt a bylaw, a bylaw like this. So, on the other hand, if Delaware's, if, if the issue starts being lost in other jurisdictions for the reason that you're articulating, then I think it would make a lot of sense for, this, for the legislature to visit the issue and see if they can't more expressly deal with um, the grant of power to a board to adopt a bylaw like this, as happened recently in the case of, I mean, I think the state had to do it a couple times in terms of uh, voting, uh, election of directors, and also the, the bylaw regarding um, reimbursement of expenses and proxy contests. So that, that certainly is an option. The unfortunately, uh, Boilermakers never made it to the Supreme Court. I think people were hoping that that might happen just to... Well, some people were. Right. <laughs> I certainly was. Yeah, other, others weren't. Commentator, right, right. I suppose that's right. But, um, but to get a final word on it, but uh, I know there have been rumblings about a, a statute among practitioners in Delaware, people talking about it, maybe just no further than the water cooler. But I think mm -hmm. until people see how how the decision plays out and how other how well it's received in other jurisdictions, uh, there may be less of a sense of urgency to make that happen because that is quite a process in Delaware. And, and Professor Demont, I you know I, I agree with Steve and and uh, Joe, but I would probably push back on you pretty hard uh, if we had the time on the, the nuanced uh, equitable decision of the Court of Chancery somehow being rather attenuated in the analysis of why stockholders have consented. Uh, it's a fundamental proposition of Delaware corporate law. There, it is just indisputable. Uh, stockholders don't get to vote every time the board changes, modifies, amends the bylaws, or adopts a bylaw. There's no stockholder vote. Correlatively, stockholders are given the express power to adopt their own bylaws. They can repeal a bylaw. They can modify a bylaw through action of the stockholders unilaterally, just as the board can do so. That proposition, I just don't think it's an arguable one at all. And so I don't think it's you know, remarkable enough to, you know, justify a statute. Although, as Steve says, if you were to get some pushback and from other states, then it might put, force Delaware to do that. Well, I see the time is out. Please join me in thanking our panelists for illuminating. I actually have one question. The final word. What is the trophy? Is that a I told him student trophy. Good you asked that, Joe.